I get a lot of comments on my YouTube channel, but there is one particular pattern or trend that I find to be particularly ridiculous. It's on a, a fairly old video of mine now called something like why Christianity is dying in the West, which tends to attract a lot of uh, unsympathetic viewers to my, my position. Um, so I give a bunch of reasons in that video that I think that the church is doing a disservice to itself and why that is leading to uh, people leaving or apostatizing. And what a, a lot of people say in contrast to my argument is the reason people are leaving the church is because we now have more access to information. We can log on to the internet and we can discover what the truth is and then compare that to the, the false claims that are made, these superstitious, uh, ridiculous religious claims that are made and realize that the truly rational conclusion is something, uh, some other alternative like atheism. And the reason I think this is so ridiculous is because anybody who spent any time on the internet knows that not everything you find on the internet is helpful or true or valid information. An abundance of information doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be more likely to get educated in the process of immersing yourself in that information. You can just as easily find propaganda or fake news or sophistry on the internet as you can something that is, is beneficial. In fact, I'd say you're more likely to find nefarious and misleading information as you are helpful or um, enlightening information. Before we get any further into the argument of this video, I just want to say a quick thank you to the sponsor of this video, which is Real Estate for Life. Because as the world becomes more dominated by things like fact checking and passports and other restrictions against our freedom, uh, you may find yourself in a situation where you're not content for the long term to be living where you are, which means that you probably want to move and find a real estate agent to help you do so. Well, Real Estate for Life is a network of real estate agents that will likely share your values if you're Christian, Catholic, or pro-life. Um, so if you don't have a realtor who you can be confident in, contact Real Estate for Life. Their website is realestateforlife.org, and they will connect you with a realtor in your area or the area that you're moving to who will be an advocate for you and the things that you believe in and help you get resituated situated in a place where you want to be. So realestateforlife.org, check them out. They'll get you connected. And this is something that over the course of the history of the internet, not a lot of people seemed to really pause and appreciate the potential for what the, the situation we find ourselves in today. I remember early on when um, I was quite young at the time, but when the internet was just getting started, um, you'd see headlines about this. You'd see news media reports about the internet and how this is going to revolutionize the world. For years, they've been saying these things would change the world would mature from adding machines and typewriters to tools of the human spirit. Now, maybe it's coming true because of internet. And most of us who finally got signed up and opened up our browser for the first time and waited for our dial-up connection to connect and make all these ridiculous noises. <laughs> And then we would try to find a website. Most of us looked at that and just sort of said, what am I supposed to do with this? Because at that point, the internet itself, the, the vast array of information and websites hadn't really been indexed very well. We didn't have search engines that were as comprehensive and as algorithmically driven as they are today to anticipate what it is that we're trying to say when we ask our clumsy questions in search boxes. And so you'd have to actually know what website you want to go to. And if you've never been on the internet before, why would you know of any particular websites? And so most of us logged on, waited for some web page, like a news page to load up, which would take like five minutes. And then we would say, this is boring. And then we would log off and go watch TV. So in spite of the fact that we were, it was insisted that this is going to revolutionize the world. Most of us had very little appreciation for how this was going to change the world at all. Most of us saw this as being overhyped and probably not something we would use very often. And 
if it didn't change and fast, we probably couldn't find much of a use for it ourselves and would probably cancel our subscriptions. But it did change and it changed fast. And it did, in fact, revolutionize the world. Um, it's one of these these scenarios where a new technology was being introduced and very few people paused to say, should we do this? How is this going to change the world? And is it going to change it for the better? We simply said, we can do this. We have the potential to do it. Therefore, we should, because it's us. We're, we're amazing. We're not going to misuse this power that we have. Of course not. And that brings us all the way up to this age of social media and fake news and misinformation that we find ourselves in today, which is, with hindsight in view, the inevitable um, outcome of this idea of just inundating or giving people unlimited access to information. Well, we know that people are dishonest. We know that people lie. We know that people manipulate. We especially know that people in positions of power are in the habit of manipulating people who are not in positions of power. So why should it come as any big surprise to us that unleashing this kind of technology and potential and power wouldn't produce this kind of an outcome where the large portions of the information that is available and accessible to us is not good for us? Simply having the means to do something doesn't mean you should do something. And that's the problem with our ethical thinking today. We simply think that we can technologize our way out of any particular problem, especially ethical problem that we've gotten ourselves into or that we find ourselves in. Um, COVID would be a good example of that for anybody who's paying attention or, or, or counting the costs here. Um, but we're not going to go down that rabbit hole right now. Uh, in the case of the internet, we're still making that same mistake. We're looking at it and saying, oh, there's a lot of bad information out there. Um, so we're just going to come up with a solution rather than revisiting the original question that we should have asked ourselves, which is, is this a good thing? Is this too much? Is this, is this a potential that is going to lead to a negative or an unethical or maybe even an evil actualization? Um, instead of revisiting that question, we're just saying, ah, let's just come up with a new uh, technology or a new solution that will solve this problem. In that case, it has become what is the phenomenon that is known as fact checking. And I'll admit that in the advent of this phenomenon, we it, it did seem to be a, a useful uh, introduction to the equation. I remember that, you know, in the early days of, of social media, especially when we hadn't learned our lesson enough times that arguing on the internet doesn't really accomplish anything, we would get into arguments. And part of that habit, because we're not trained in logic or dialectic or philosophy that we would, uh, like our ancestors had been if they had gotten a liberal arts education, we have focused all of our attention on things like math and science and uh, social and history to some degree, but a much uh, reduced degree. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things, but we've abandoned dialectic, we've abandoned logic, we've abandoned philosophy, and we've abandoned rhetoric, the idea of persuasive uh, communication, employing logic and philosophy. And so we don't know how to debate anymore. So one of the common tactics that people would use is they'd go take 30 seconds to go Google the particular topic that they find themselves in an argument about, find some article that seems to uh, be consistent with whatever their particular position is, and then just paste that into a comment thread and say, aha, see, see, just read that and you'll see how you're wrong and how I'm right, obviously. But the problem that isn't obvious to the person who's in the habit of using that as an argumentation tactic is that it's usually fallacious. It's an argument from authority. It's an authority that I recognize because they're sympathetic to my view, but my interlocutor doesn't rec recognize, and therefore it's an argument of ath from authority, which is a fallacy. It's a logical fallacy. Um, and it's not very effective either because the person on the other end could just go and spend 30 seconds of their time finding some, some article that is sympathetic to their view and paste it in as well. Neither of us gets anywhere or accomplishes anything using those kinds of tactics. And so when fact checking was introduced to the internet, um, it became something of a trump card where, yeah, maybe your article says this, maybe my article says this, but my article is a fact check article. Like it has this weight of authority that the other person can't deny anymore. That would end this cycle of back and forth that, that could find no end in sight. 
But because this is just one more solution that never goes through the rigors of a difficult question like, is this going to be helpful? Is this something we ought to do? Or is this going to add more problems in the future? We just went ahead and did it because we could. And now we're finding ourselves in a situation where the problems with fact checking are becoming quite a bit more apparent. But now a new phenomenon has, a, uh, has emerged from this that I consider extremely problematic, which is that certain positions that are based on arguments are getting fact checked. And you can't fact check an argument. Let me explain what I mean by that. An argument is composed of a number of variables, including facts, that can be described as premises. So several premises, either in a linear way or from multiple directions, can all accumulate to produce a particular conclusion. And something like that is what we mean by an argument. We're looking at all the pieces of evidence that support a conclusion, and then we present them, and that's our argument. Now, the thing about arguments is that they're complicated. They can be they can have a lot of details that are hard to keep in view and keep in balance to appreciate the full scope of what it is that it is actually accumulating to lead to that particular conclusion. Um, whereas a fact is extremely simple, and that's why we can verify it or falsify it very easily. For example, if I said something like, I live in Canada, that's a fact or it's a falsehood. And it's not very it's not a complicated claim. It's very easy for someone to do a little bit of digging to verify where it is that I'm a resident and then say yes, either that's true or that's false. That's the kind of thing that fact checking is quite useful for. But if I said something like I'm a very good citizen, well that's quite different because there are a number of variables you might want to consider that lead to that conclusion or lead against that conclusion. For example, you have to establish what it is, what, what it means to be a good citizen. How do you evaluate what a good citizen is? And there are several premises that contribute to that particular conclusion or that premise um, that could lead to the claim that I'm a good citizen. If you wanna push back against an argument that somebody else has made, you have to make an argument of your own often with the same level of nuance and complexity, composing it out of premises and facts and evidence. What you can't do is simply say, oh, it's been fact checked, because you can't just fact check something as complex as an, ar as an argument. Let me use an analogy that I think will be helpful here. What if I said that facts are to sentences what arguments are to books? So the reason I say that is because a sentence is a fairly simple thing. A person can evaluate a, a sentence and, and, and say whether it's a good sentence or a bad sentence. Is it eloquent? Is it grammatically correct? Are there problems with the way that it's composed? We know what a sentence is. A sentence is supposed to have a certain kind of structure to it. Um, does the sentence that we're evaluating um, live up to what a good sentence should be? Um, so that's something that, that is fairly simple and fairly easy to do in the same way that verifying a fact is a simple and easy thing to do. And it's the kind of thing that can build, you can, it's easy to build consensus around because of its simplicity. Most people can understand it and understand whether or not it's true or false or whether or not this sentence is, is a good sentence or not. But to say that a book is a good book or not, well, that's quite a bit more complicated. And even, uh, the kind of thing that, reasonable people can disagree on because of its complexity. In the same way, certain kinds of arguments, especially if they're complex arguments, are the kind of thing that reasonable people can sometimes disagree about. Now, there are certainly some, some kinds of arguments that have fatal logic in them, and people can point that out and make their case. But even then, that's not the same thing as fact-checking. That's offering a rebuttal or a refutation of a particular argument based on variables or or rules of logic that we've all agreed upon. But now the problem that I'm seeing is that particular conclusions that are based on a number of pieces of evidence, variables and premises are, are getting fact checked in the media. And also the, the, uh, the roster of people who are considered fact checkers, it used to be just art, uh, websites like Snopes, but now we're seeing like mainstream media outlets fact-checking supposed claims that are out there on the internet. But these claims aren't 
simple facts. They are often arguments and conclusions. And we're seeing this especially prevalent uh, about COVID. We're seeing certain experts getting up and saying um, that certain things um, are are worthy of consideration, certain conclusions based on an argument. And then we're seeing mainstream media outlets fact-checking these arguments. Well, as I've said before, you can't fact-check an argument. The best thing you can do is offer a refutation, but that's just a counter-argument. You can't call that fact-checking. To, to do so is dishonest, and I would say a form of manipulation or propaganda. And worst of all in this, Groups like Facebook, who heavily now employ fact-checking to uh, to monitor the conversations that supposedly free people are having, has now openly admitted that their supposed fact-checking is actually just advancing an opinion. So this lawsuit was brought forward recently uh, against Facebook by a journalist named John, I think his name is John Stossel, um, ab about the issue of climate change. And in that in that court case, Facebook admitted that the third party um, fact checkers that they contract um, are actually just offering opinion. But that's not how we as the users are supposed to understand this. We're supposed to understand this as truth and falsehood, as in this is credible and this is true and this has been fact checked and what somebody else has posted is actually just false. But when it's just a matter of opinion or argument, um, it shouldn't carry that kind of gravity and it certainly shouldn't be used to impose uh, censorship upon certain ideas or alternative opinions. We live in a society with a diversity and a range of ethical opinions, opinions about the truth, opinions about how best to live our lives, political opinions. And for any major um, uh, regulator of public conversation like Facebook to say that only one particular opinion is allowed, and we're going to call that the fact-based opinion, well, I, th I hope you can see the problem with that. David Mickelson, the co-founder of the fact-checking website Snopes, has long presented himself as the arbiter of truth online, but he has been lying to the site's tens of millions of readers. A BuzzFeed News investigation has found that between 2015 and 2019, Mickelson wrote and published dozens of articles containing material plagiarized from news outlets such as The Guardian and The LA Times. Here's the problem with appointing third-party fact-checkers to arbitrate reasonable opinions that could be held in contrast to each other, is that those people uh, aren't, are just as flawed as the rest of us. They could have other motivations or incentives for taking a particular position, and and it might be a conflict of interest. It might be their own political or religious opinions that are interfering with their ability to be objective. Uh, and so as people who live in what is supposed to be a liberal democracy, which means that we're supposed to have freedom of thought. I'm not saying that's something I endorse necessarily, but that's the contract, the supposed social contract that we've all signed on to. If we're going to believe in that, um, well, then that should inform all aspects of the way that we engage each other in conversation. And since social media has become the dominant uh, public forum by which we, we engage with each other and we debate and we share information, then I would like to think that um, a diversity of what could be considered reasonable opinions based on arguments, arguments that have been advanced, should be permissible. And the fact that they're not right now that should scare a lot of us thanks for watching the reason i can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers if you feel called to support this work then consider joining the reinforcements which is my online community there are multiple tiers including free access for those who can't help financially but still want to join you can join up at www.brianholtworth.ca Certain levels will also get a free gift basket from Glory and Shine, who is a family-owned Catholic bath and body products company, whose beard balm I'm wearing right now. It's like aromatherapy for your face. Even if you don't join, they make amazing products, so check them out at gloryandshine.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. You don't have to agree with everything I said to get value out of these kinds of conversations, so be sure to subscribe to be edified or challenged. There's value in both.